Rakesh. Uh, the title is uh, Fixed Angle Inverse Scattering for Riemannian Matrix. Rakesh, please. So can you see my uh, slides? Mm -hmm. Not yet? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to give the talk, and uh, it's a great honor, um, especially with Professor, Professor Romano being present here. This is the first time I've seen him face to face. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about the uh, fixed angle inverse scattering problem for a Riemannian metric. Uh, uh, Mikhail, is my voice clear? Uh, Mikhail? Ah. Uh, is my voice clear to you? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just yes. checking. Okay. So this is based on joint work with uh, uh, Lori Oksanen from University of Helsinki and uh, Mick Kosalo from University of Yuvaskala. And uh, my uh, some of my work was supported by the National Science Foundation. So uh, before I go ahead and describe what the problem is for the uh, Riemannian metric, I first wanted to talk about an older result, just, just to set the uh, situation. Uh, and then what is the difference between what I did in the past and what our new results are? So we're going to consider an acoustic medium, meaning in which, you know, we're going something which is governed by the a hyperbolic PDE. And Q of X is going to be some acoustic property of the medium. And QX will be a smooth function, which is supported in the unit ball. So the situation is more like this. Uh, we have a acoustic medium occupying all of Rn. Uh, Q of X is a smooth function whose support is inside this unit ball. And we send a plane wave traveling in the direction omega. It interacts with the medium and, you know, the response sort of travels in all directions. And we make far field measurements. Uh, I will describe all of this carefully. And we do it for all time, all frequencies. So if you're doing it in the frequency domain. So we, there is only a single incoming wave, but we measure the far field in all directions and for all frequencies. And our goal is to recover this Q of X. And I'll be more careful with the model in a second. So we actually work in the time domain. So knowing for all frequencies means knowing for all time. Um, that's what, and so, you know, you, so this, you send in the plane wave, that is the initial data. So this is the plane wave coming in. And the medium property Q of X is in the zeroth order term. So outside the unit ball, it's just the standard wave equation. So delta T minus X dot omega is the solution of this equation outside the unit ball. So this is our initial value problem, forward problem. If you know the Q, uh, this equation has a, is well posed and it has a unique solution. And so we can define the forward map for a fixed direction omega, which maps Q to the value of the solution on the boundary of this uh, unit ball for a certain time period. Okay. And one can show that knowing the far field data for all frequencies and in all directions is equivalent to knowing this. Uh, one can show that. So this is the forward map. It maps the coefficient Q to the value of the solution on the boundary of the unit ball for a certain time period. And the inverse problem is, you know, so given this data, the measurement on the boundary of the ball, can we recover Q? So of course, you know, the question is F mega injective. And if it is injective, is the inverse Lipschitz continuous? So, uh, this problem actually is still open. It's a long-standing open problem. It's called the fixed angle scattering problem. Uh, it's a 
we are, I mean, it's, we are all experts in not, so I won't emphasize this, but F omega is nonlinear. Important thing is it's a formally determined inverse problem. Uh, Q depends on n variables. And since omega is fixed, the data U omega depends on the variables on the boundary, which is n minus one and one time, that's n variables. So it's a formally determined inverse problem and that's why it's difficult. And this problem is still open actually. Um, it's been open for a long time. So in 2020, uh, we could not solve this problem, but we said instead of having one direction, if you give us data for two directions and the directions have to be equal, uh, exactly opposite to each other. So you send in a plane wave omega, measure all around uh, for a certain time period on the boundary, and then you send it from minus omega and you measure all around the boundary, the solution for a certain time period. So if you give us both, then the map from the potential to this data is injective and the inverse is Lipschitz continuous. So we proved that in 2020. Um, and it was an application of the bokeem kibanov method, but a variation of that. So this is what is known when the coefficient is in the zeroth order term. So we wondered whether we could get a similar result when the coefficient is in the principal part. So here the velocity of the medium is constant. So we wanted to see if you could study your problem in which the velocity of the medium is not constant because then the solution of the forward problem is much more complicated. So that was a goal. And uh, here is the velocity problem. So we have a smooth function rho of x, which is like velocity. It's actually the, loosely speaking, the reciprocal of the velocity. So the velocity is one outside the ball. Okay, so here is the picture. So rho is like, rho is like one over c square. So the velocity is one outside the ball and uh, inside the ball, you know, it's some, 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 some smooth function. And of course the velocity is positive everywhere. And we do the same experiment. We send in a single plane wave measure the response in all directions for all frequencies. But we don't, we just do the time domain version, which is we'll measure the response on the boundary of the ball. So here is the forward problem. Rho is one over C squared, but it's easier to work with rho rather than C. So uh, it's the U, U omega is the solution of the wave equation with non-constant velocity. Here is the incoming plane wave. We've used a heavy side rather than a delta, but they are interchangeable in some way. You can differentiate with respect to time and get the delta. So we can define the forward map, uh, which maps the row, which is, we call the slowness, to the value of the solution on the boundary of the domain, boundary of the unit ball for a time period. And the question is, uh, can you recover the, the slowness rho from this boundary measurement for a single incoming direction of omega? And uh, is, is it stable? So as usual, uh, f omega is nonlinear and it's also a formally determined inverse problem, just like the uh, previous case. Um, and it's a much harder problem. I, in fact, I was scared to even try it for a long time because uh, I didn't quite know how to deal with this non-constant velocity. Um, so instead of a zeroth order coefficient, the coefficient we're trying to recover is related to the velocity of the waves. And I'll explain a little bit later why, why it seems that this Q problem is uh, much harder. And of course, this problem is still open. So let me talk a little bit about the history of this problem. So you have a smooth slowness rho, which is one over C squared. And rho is one, out, the speed is one outside the ball. And we have the forward map, 
which maps the slowness to the value of the solution on the boundary. Okay, and the goal is to invert f omega. That means is f omega injected, for example. If we assume that rho is layered, the medium is layered. For example, uh, you know, you could think of the earth. So if the earth is just, uh, the velocity depends only on the depth, for example, then it uh, converts to a one dimensional problem. And uh, the, the results there are well known. F is injective, uh, stable. There is a range characterization, immersion algorithm, all kinds of things. And that's due to the work of Gelfand, Leviton, Prine, and many others in from the 1950s and 80s. And it was a major accomplishment. It's still, even in one dimension, it's a really serious, non-trivial problem, quite difficult. And it's amazing that uh, one has, you know, such strong results for this. And not just index shifty and stability, but the range characterization, inversion algorithm, all these things. So that's uh, if the medium is uh, layered. So what if the medium is not layered, and it's a general thing, then Professor Romanov in 2002 showed that if, as long as we restrict the, the slownesses are close to one. So the medium is not one, but it's close to one inside the ball and it's one outside. Then the map, uh, this map for a single di incoming direction, that map is injective and stable. Uh, when rho is close to one, uh, there are no caustics in the solution, which I'll talk a little bit about in this. But even with that, th this is still a very, uh, it's a non-trivial result. It can seem like, you know, all these things where things are close to the constant case are simple, but this is still a fairly difficult thing. And they, Professor Romanov introduced a very important idea in this, which I will talk about a little later. And later on in 2022, they were not aware of Professor Romanov's work. Ma, Potenciano, and Solo showed a similar kind of result using a different technique. Uh, they were appealing to more general, you know, inverse function theorem type arguments. Uh, it's a sort of a complicated argument, and it's not clear how much it will generalize. Um, so the question is, what happens when rho is not required to be close to one? Is f omega, the map from rho to the data, is it still injective? And a very special case of that problem is, suppose the data from this rho matches the data from the, when the medium is one. Does that imply that the medium is one? So it's a very simple kind of question. But we, the important thing is we, we do not assume that rho is close to one. So it's uh, sort of going a little beyond what Professor Romano studied. Uh, so if the medium has the same data as if the mean speed was one, does it imply rho equals one? That's a very special case. And more generally, of course, is f omega injective? Okay, and we want to study this when rho is not close to one. So these two questions, so the question we answered was actually the this question here, that if the medium if the medium response is the same as the response when the velocity is one, uh, then we show that rho equals one, and we do not make any other assumptions rho. We do not make assume that rho is close to one or that there are no caustics. So here is what our result is. This is just a restatement of the problem. Okay, we have a slowness rho which is slowness is one outside the ball. We have the map from the slowness to the data, where the data is the solution of this wave equation, where there's an incoming plane wave, and the data is measured on the boundary. And the theorem says that we fix the direction, one direction, slowness is smooth and positive, slowness is one outside the ball, and we choose T large enough. Uh, is dependence on the upper bound and the size of rho. Then if the data for one and data for rho match, then rho will be one. We make no other assumptions on rho. We don't say anything about caustics or whether it's close to one or anything like that. But uh, uh, Rakesh, uh, f omega 
of one means that you have no response, right? It, it is, yes, essentially, it's got just a plane wave response. Uh -huh. It's H T minus X dot omega. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But if you remove that, yes, there is no response. So if you take, if you take, what is the, if the reflection data is zero, yes, does yes. that imply the medium is constant? Uh -huh. Right? So it's a very simple, but the important thing is that we do not assume anything special about the row. That is the main point here. We do not assume that the solution U omega does not have caustics or any such assumption. The main issue really is that the solution U omega gets very complicated for arbitrary row. But Rakesh, row is smooth Correct. only in a ball, in no, the no, ball or everywhere. It's smooth everywhere. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's one outside the wall. Mm -hmm. So the major improvement here is that the solution U omega can be quite complicated. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, like there is a surface and it's supported on one side of the surface or something like that. So, you know, the when you're trying to write on the solution, the solution U omega may involve caustics and things like that. So that is the improvement. So how do we handle those things? By the way, I'm sorry, uh, I will not tell you anything about the proof because we haven't posted any of these results or the work. We're trying to write two papers and uh, we want to you know, publish them together. So we haven't posted anything like this. So I will not tell you anything about the methods, I'm sorry. But we hope to tell you the uh, methods in about a month or so and post everything. Uh, so, that's the result that, you know, if the data matches the data for the constant medium, then it's, but the general question is, what if F rho omega rho one equals F, does it imply rho one equals to rho two, right? That's the more general question and that's still open. But the thing is that we could not solve this problem even for the Q problem. That is unsolved even for the, when you know, replace rho by the Q, that problem is unsolved even for the potential. So if you couldn't do the potential, we're not going to do it for the velocity, this general problem. But for the potential problem, we had, we solved the Q version of the problem, but we needed two pieces of data. So the next question we can ask is, well, suppose I give you two pieces of data for this row problem, right? So we give you the data for this row problem, data coming from the omega and the data coming from minus omega. Now, can you say that, can you solve this problem? And uh, we have some sort of a result. It's not very general. Uh, we can do, we can say that, yes, it is true for row one, which satisfies certain geometrical properties. Okay, but uh, as I said, this is still work in progress. So, you know, we proved this theorem here is the case where rho one is equal to one. But what kind of properties? So more geometrical properties about not being caustics and things like that. So it's not mm -hmm. a very general result yet. Uh -huh. So we want to so the theorem is when the rho one is equal to one. That's what the theorem is about. And we wanted to see, can we enlarge the class of rho ones that's what we are trying to do. And we can do it for a certain other class and this row one need not be close to one. So we're trying to like enlarge the class, you know, instead of one here, we can want to put some other row one here, more general than one. And uh, we have some work in progress. We have some results, but not the general case, far from the general case. Uh, we cannot do any for any row one which has you know the caustics and stuff. So row two can be anything. So we have this technique where if one of them has nice properties, row one, then row two will also have nice properties. But what the starting row one is has to be nice to begin with. So, but that's a more general. Uh, I mean, it's only some families of row one we can do this, but it's more than just one or close to one. So 
Then the next question was, okay, so now here is a problem in which we're trying to recover the velocity of the medium. What if there are, you know, uh, a matrix, you know, like an isotropic medium? Can we recover the velocity in that case? Which means, suppose the medium is governed by a Riemannian metric. So the acoustic property of the medium now is governed by a Riemannian metric Gij. And the metric is one outside the unit ball. And G is smooth and everything. And we ask the same question. So you fix an incoming direction omega. And you map the metric to the value of the solution on the boundary of the unit ball. Where u omega is a solution now of this wave equation. Now here the metric shows up in the Laplacian. So again, this is a medium with non-constant velocity, but it's anisotropic. So same problem, but instead of single velocity, now we have this system with some matrix, symmetric and by and positive definite matrix. And the question is, is f omega injective? Is it stable? And how to invert f omega? Same questions. And... Uh, the only difference is that now we are trying to recover a matrix. So a single measurement will not do. You're trying to recover, you know, n, n plus one over two different coefficients. So we will need at least that many different directions in principle, data from that many different directions. So let omega be the set of unit vectors in so many different unit vectors. And we are going to take this little omega in different n n plus one over two different little omega. So we map this um, uh, uh, metric matrix into the boundary values of the solutions for n n plus one over two different directions. And the question is, uh, is f omega injective? Okay, and of course it's a formally determined problem and it's harder than the row problem. Well, because, you know, we are not trying to combine information from many different solutions, n, n plus one over two different solutions. Rakesh, so how are you is, going to combine the, information the from those this, things? What is, uh, what is the reason to introduce this, uh, this value, n, n plus one by two? Why? 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the matrix G has it's a symmetric matrix. It has n n plus one over two different. Ah. Components. Okay. Okay. It's just a number of independent components in the Riemannian tensor. That's right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So, so you know that's why this is harder than the row problem because now we're trying to recover n n plus one over two different coefficients. So. It'll take more work than trying to recover the row problem. So in this case, uh, so I'm just repeating my statement here. Uh, U omega is the solution. So what we do is we take the data from these n plus n n plus one over two different directions. So we take the n unit vectors in the standard axis directions, and then these combinations. Okay and you define f omega, and you have the data for omega in all these directions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you ask the question, can is f omega injective? And again, a theorem is that if G is a smooth Riemannian metric, which is the identity matrix, the, the Euclidean metric outside the unit ball, and T is large enough, that depends on limit on the size of G, upper bound T, then, if the G, uh, G, G solutions and the Euclidean solutions, they have to get the same data, then G is up to I up to a dip, and we, up to a diffeomorphism. And you cannot do better than this because uh, the data is unchanged. If you do a diffeomorphism, which is uh, the identity outside the ball, you'll get the same data. So you cannot do better than this. Uh, so 
rather than answer the general question that you know f omega g1 equals f g2 does e1 equal to g we don't know the answer to that but we can recover the metric euclidean metric up to a diffeomorphism if you compare it to the uh, the data to the euclidean metric And the general question, does f omega g1 you know, imply g1 up to dinner? We have some ideas uh, with a larger set of directions, but no results yet in this case. So, you know, instead of uh, g1 equals the identity, okay. can we enlarge it to the class some other g's, just like we were trying to do for the rows? Uh, but we have no results yet for this. Um, we have a se result similar to this theorem where instead of the Riemannian metric, now we allow a Lorentzian, which means you know it's like a wave-like operator, but we have a Lorentzian metric. So you know it's a metric with signature minus one and uh, n pluses. And then there is a corresponding operator, the wave operator. And we have a result similar to this theorem, which is we can, uh, we can identify a Lorentzian metric uh, if it is the same as the Minkowski metric. The data is the same as the Minkowski matrix. And in this case, our coefficients can depend on x and t. So uh, we have a generalization also to the Lorentzian case, but nothing about the general case. So I wanted to, I mean, I'm sorry, but some of you already know all this stuff, but I will still talk a little about why are the velocity recovery problems when you're trying to recover the, the slowness rho or the Riemannian metric G, why are they harder than the problem where the, the coefficient is in the zeroth order term? And the answer is because the structure of the forward problem, the solution of the forward problem is much harder when the velocity is not constant. And that makes it very hard to work for the inverse problem. So for the Q problem, uh, you know, if you send in the plane wave and this is the zeroth order coefficient, the solution has this very simple form. It's U of xt is the solution is supported inside this, you know, if you take omega to be the z axis, the solution is supported above the plane, t equal to z, and it's a smooth function above it. That's it. It just has this very nice, simple form. And notice that the plane doesn't change as you change Q. Only the little U changes. So we can work with a smooth function U on the same domain, no matter what the Q. This is when it's a zero order coefficient. And this is very different from when you have the velocity problem, for example, and even if you assume that the solution has no caustics, which means that supposedly the solution can be written as the solution is sitting above some surface t equals alpha x, and it's smooth out. Even under this very strong assumption, it's still a difficult problem. In general, the cell capital U will not be of this form, but even in the special case, when there are so-called no caustics, the solution U looks like this, which is smooth. But the important point is that this surface alpha x depends on the velocity. So if you change velocities, the surface changes. So if you are if you're doing the case, so you, you have the solution corresponding to rho one, rho two, and you're trying to work with this little u, the domains in which u one and u two are defined, they're different. So u one and u two are not defined on the same domain because the surface alpha depends on the rho. So how are you going to study, compare u one and u two for two different velocities? Right? Normally, the trick is to take the difference and work with the difference, but U1 and U2 are on different domains. So how are you going to do this? And th that's why even the row near one case is hard. Even for row near one, these issues come up. And Professor Romanov had a very clever idea to tackle this. 
So even when Rho1 and Rho2 are close to one, it's still a hard problem because the domains of U1 and U2 are different. What does uh, it mean how to compare? You just yes. compare U1 and U2 at the boundary of the ball. But, but when you're trying to apply PDE techniques, right? So you take the difference and you work with the difference. And what domain are you going to work on? It's clear, yes. Yeah. So, and that's what, and you see all our, all our uniqueness results are based on working on the difference of the solution. But nevertheless, the data can be compared with no problem at the boundary. <laughs> well, I mean, by the way, so yeah, they can be compared, yeah. But notice that, you know, so if they are the same, then of course they are the same. Uh, the alpha one and alpha two are the same on the boundary. But inside the domain, you know, they can be very different. Sure, sure. And they could intersect in strange ways. And that is when, if the solution you had no caustics. So if the row is very special, has no, so for example, if row is near one. Mm -hmm. So, and the same issues arise when G is a Riemannian metric, similar problems. And there is no such issue when it's a Q problem because then it's just the plane wave, t, the large plane is t equal to x dot omega and everything is fine. So that's why the Q problem is much easier. Well, this is only one of the difficulties, but the second difficulty is about the row and the, the solution you may have caustics, meaning the solution actually for a general row does not need to look like this. It doesn't have this form. Uh, it's not like there is some surface and it's that. So, so if you try to solve this problem for a general row or for the Riemannian metric, the solution is not going to be of this simple form. Actually, your solution starts out like a plane wave. And if you're lucky, it will go into a surface when you follow the geodesics. But many times this surface will fold over itself or actually even, you know, these, this surface could collapse into singular things. And uh, so this is sort of like the caustic, you know, it can have a tangent. So the general solution of this for a, for a solution of this for rho, for this plane wave, can be very, very complicated. I mean, in general, it's this theory of Fourier integral, uh, Fourier integral distribution, the Lagrangian distribution. So the singular structure of this is given by a Lagrangian manifold whose projection, these are the project, which is in cotangent bundle, and these are its projections onto the XT space, and they can be very complicated. So that is why when I was, our result, we do not assume that this, when we are comparing the rho to the one or the G to the I, we are not assuming that the solution has no caustics. We are assuming it's a general solution. It could be, it could have all this structure. And that is where I think, you know, so what that is what is different about the work. That we sort of say that, you know, okay, your general row, your solution is like this, but when the data matches the Euclidean case, then actually it imposes a structure on this. That is one of the steps in our work. That it imposes a structure on the singularities of you. So, uh, here is a summary of uh, what, I'm sorry again, as I said, I haven't told you anything at all about our methods. Uh, so here is a summary of our results. So for the row case, uh, we look at uh, the map from rho to u omega, where u omega is a solution of this wave equation with the non-constant velocity for a plane wave. And Professor Romanov showed that if f omega rho one, if the data agrees for rho one and rho two on the boundary, then rho one is equal to rho two, provide rho one and rho two are close to one, in which case there are no caustics. As I said, they introduced, he introduced a very important idea that how to handle the case when the data are on two different domains. Then our result is a slightly different direction that if the medium, if the data matches the one where the medium has constant velocity throughout, then rho equals one. The rho solution may have caustics. Uh, we do not make any assumptions about that. And we have a similar result where we can replace this operator by the 
operator associated with a Riemannian metric or with a Lorentzian metric. Uh, for the Lorentzian met metric, the coefficients depend on space and time. So data is, there's more data needed. Otherwise, you know, it would not be a, it'll be an underdetermined problem. And we also have some partial results in this case. So we have data from two directions, plus and minus omega, and we have row one and row two. Then row one is equal to row two, provided row one satisfies some geometrical conditions. One of them is that there are no caustics, but there are some other conditions. What we are trying to do is we are trying to generalize this result that if it is, you know, so I want to make row one to be different from one and still obtain some result like this. So we have some progress, but uh, not, uh, not a more gen very general situation. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. There is questions, comments, remarks. I remember about two years ago, there was a very interesting paper by Oxenin and, and some, something more, I don't remember, uh, regarding uh, which, uh, which is devoted to reconstruction of Lorentzian metric, but uh, by many measurements. Correct. Uh, very, very impressive result. By the way, uh, they use arguments like in boundary control method, controllability, uh, controllability for this kind of metrics uh, and so on. And uh, also, uh, also, uh, what about Romanov result for one measurement, uh, for uh, one measurement data, uh, very turning to, to the case of raw analytic with respect to horizontal variables. Yes, yeah. I don't remember uh, how six uh, pl play uh, any role in this result. I don't, I don't remember. Well, Professor Romanov maybe, is here. Maybe he can tell us about it. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but I, I know it. I saw the results in the book and I've, I've read it at times. Uh, uh -huh. You know, you have the family of solutions with uh, yeah, analytic. It's very, very interesting. Uh, I've read those things, actually. Yes, uh, I should have mentioned that. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, it is it, it is not a drawback, but just to compare to compare the results. I well, mean, I, I, I will not say what. Let Professor Romanov say what he did. I mean, I I have my interpretation of what I think he did, but uh, I would like to hear what Professor Romanov says. Uh -huh. But uh, the last result which you mentioned. Uh, by Rakesh Salo Oxenen is very nice, really, and strong and nice. You mean uh, the last the last one? Uh, uh, no, previous. Yeah, this one. Wait, 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 wait. This one, yes. Remanded metric, yes, correct. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my goal was, I, I was actually, you know, if you know this, before this, I'd never worked on a, any problem with non-constant velocity. I never worked on it. I was always scared. Because I really didn't know how to do this. And Rakesh, um, uh -huh. Rakesh and but, what about uh, what about inversion procedure? Uh, uh, is it uh, is it purely uniqueness result? It's a purely uniqueness result. Purely uniqueness, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see. And nevertheless, it uh, uh, it allows it provides some stability result also. Um, no. N not in this so, case. Yeah, the, the last result that on this page. The, no, no, I that, mean Oxen in Rakesh Salo, previous, previous result. Previous, yeah, no, uh, it, no, there's not, it's not a stability. It's 
the fact that uh, the data is the same, that plays a very important role. Uh -huh. The important point is that, you know, remember that you're starting out with a row in which the solution may have caustics. Uh, it's very hard to work with solutions which have caustics. So the first sure, step, sure, sure, sure. It's the first step is to it, show yeah. that row cannot have caustics. Yes, the problem is really very hard. Yeah. yeah. So that is the that is the change. That is the big change it is. So in some sense, we still haven't faced the fact that uh -huh. what do you do if the solutions have caustics? No one knows the answer to that question. Yes. Okay, more questions? No, but I would like to express my thanks to Professor Rakesh. It's very interesting talk for me. And uh -huh. I read your uh, papers with Sala uh, what, uh, and uh, Oxygen. Uh, Oxygen, sorry. Oxygen, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> it's also very interesting for fixed uh, angle if, and to opposite direction. Quite interesting, and uh, the the point uh, so 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 very interesting problem. You have solved this for for first time. So yes, thank you, thank you. As I said, I always I've read you all many of your books very carefully, and okay. a lot of my techniques are from you. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. Okay, Thank, Thanks again. Yes, for, yeah. for for the for the good talk. And now we have coffee break for 10 minutes.